I'm delighted to be joined once again by Kate Shemarani. Uh, when we last spoke to Kate, uh, she had been arrested. She'd been charged with uh, public nuisance and conspiracy to incite violence, a common law crime with a potential jail sentence of life. Uh, she was under uh, restrictive bail conditions. She couldn't enter London. She couldn't attend any demonstrations or really speak out at all uh, publicly uh, about uh, the COVID crisis or any of the related matters to do with the medical establishment. Now, since then, Kate, things have taken uh, a turn for the better. <laughs> yeah, well, we um, first thing we did was we, um, I don't know what you call it, filed, lodged an appeal against the bail conditions, which would have been in court this Friday. And almost uh, within 24 hours of that, 48 hours, um, I was told the, char the Crown Prosecution Service weren't going to go ahead with it weren't going to support the case. And that was the end of that. Now I was already uh, served a 10,000 pound fine. Um, so wait, 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 so, 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 they, so they, they, they've completely abandoned the case entirely? Yeah, so to, initially they gave the same thing through the post. Uh, Fiona for um, arranging the event and me for uh, being, being involved, uh, involved in the event. So, well, that would mean everybody would need to get a £10,000 fine. All the doctors that spoke, everybody that was there. So that was the first thing. And then we questioned, because that would then be double D, because the, they were already saying we were guilty of that. So I'd, um, I'd then filed to have these bail restrictions lifted. And, and that's when we were told everything was, was thrown out and we would get our phones and our laptops, our belongings back. Uh, and that was that. And then all of a sudden, how, uh, how, did, how, how does how does that work? I mean, you, you're facing these very restrictive charges. Did you get something in writing that said that, that there is no case to answer? Did you get something to say? I mean, how how did that information actually get imparted to you? Well, I got an email, an email from the solicitor, and a phone call, and um, it was it was really odd. And that we would we would be told when we could collect our uh, it was phones, laptop, my phone, laptop, and some notebooks. And it, Fiona, it was notebook and her laptop. So that was what it was. And then we had to then wait. Uh, it, we said, "Well, we want to collect them now," um, but no, we couldn't collect them now. We had to wait a few days, and then we kept pushing. And then we were uh, told the day before we were due to go and collect our things that we couldn't actually have our laptops um, in case we objected to the fines. And because they believed there may be <laughs> um, evidence on the laptops, which there's nothing on mine other than patient photographs, videos I've done, teaching videos, interviews. So um, that's what, so they've kept them basically. Um, well, they, those ten thousand pounds, ten thousand pound fines are unlawful anyway, so they can, they can see me in court with it then. Um, so that was what we were told. So we headed down to uh, Charing Cross Police Station, which was, uh, it was bizarre. It is bizarre. Um, we went in there, and, and this, I want to tell people this because it was so weird. It was beyond weird. There was a lot of cops, sort of in the vicinity. Um, uh, incidentally, I didn't know what the front of Charing Cross Police Station looked like because I got lobbed out the back door. I wasn't allowed out the front. I was taken back through the cage, only to find out later that's because there was quite a lot of people outside the front uh, waiting. So we went in, and for anyone who's been in there, there's a, it, it's like sort of being at a bad bank. There's the glass screens, and there was a couple of people there that were doing whatever they were doing. It was no privacy whatsoever and this poor woman at one of the desks was showing something on her legs and something on her arms it was just it was ridiculous and all of a sudden behind these two people that were the other side of the glass screens this woman appeared uh, with a with a mask right over her mouth and up to her eyes and I was with Dr Kevin Corbett and Fiona Hine there was two police officers to our right and I think her lawyer or somebody like that was sitting behind and then three people that were doing, you know, up, up at the kiosk. And this woman started to say something. My hearing's not brilliant. I worked on an air, air, worked for an airline for years and I've lost my high and my low hearing, but I couldn't hear anything she was saying, nothing. Nor could Kevin, nor could Fiona. 
and nor could the two police officers to my right because they were later telling us this. So she carried on. I didn't know she was talking to me. And then she started doing this and pointing at me and then holding up a plastic bag with my iPhone in. I recognised the case. So I just kept saying, I can't hear you. I cannot hear you. So then this lady that was waiting, she said, oh, come, come here. So I went and I listened and she said, I'm not coming out there. It's my right not to be filmed. And I said, no one's filming you. No one's filming you, madam. And Kevin held his hands up. I said, no one's filming you. And she said, you need to come in here on your own to collect this. And I went, I'm not coming anywhere with you. I'm not coming through any doors with you. I don't trust them. So um, she just disappeared. She just disappeared. And Fiona Hines said, oh, that was the police officer that when she was arrested and she was taken into the cage, that particular police officer said, this is, this is serious. You could go to prison for life for this. That's what she actually said to Fiona. So all of a sudden, one of these two cops that was at the side disappeared and came back with my phone and just gave it to me. Just gave it to me in my hand. So um, I said, oh, thank you. And then I said, Did, could you hear what she was saying? And they both went, no. I mean, I don't know what she was trying to prove. It was pathetic. So we then promptly in front of this big picture, we did a live video, uh, we did a video, sorry. No one was in the camera, just me, like I am now. Um, and Kevin videoed me and I basically said, um, the, these two, it was a burner phone as well, um, a burner phone and an iPhone. I like the term burner because it makes me sound like a crook. Um, and uh, I said, neither of these phones have been in my possession for almost two weeks and I cannot take responsibility of what is on them. Because if you can download stuff, anyone can download, and they'd been on my phones, they'd had a look on my phones. I don't trust them. And the very, the very um, crime that they were investigating me for, which there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever, all over the place was footage, which we downloaded onto memory sticks and spread it everywhere, was of me saying, we are peaceful, do not be violent. Um, we don't want the police de defeated. It was all like that. So um, uh, I did this video and says, I can't believe, you know, whatever's on these phones, they're actually going to be swept to see if there's anything on that's been added or any tracking on them, whatever. But um, it was it was bizarre, totally bizarre. And those that offence apparently hasn't been used for 14 years. And here was I, no previous convictions, nothing, odd speeding ticket for doing like 35 um, nothing, and and I'm in there after being MC at a rally, and they they investigate me for that. Really, really, but you can go out and rape and murder and do every. And actually, you can indeed rock up, roll out of a van, shoulder to shoulder with all your buddies. Because don't forget, it said on the BBC News, police do not have to download track and trace, and they don't need to self isolate because it's clearly a one way virus. Um, but they can rock up at a peaceful event with men, women and children, pile out uh, shoulder to shoulder with their bodies, trunch and drawn, go running into a crowd, wallop people around the head, in the red zones, in the face. You should see the emails and the texts I've got from people that have taken photographs of their injuries. They've got videos of it and they're now all reporting it as a crime. Good. Uh, but that's allowed. Just, I'd, I'd like to get to that in a bit more detail, but. I'm, I'm, I'm really perplexed by the way this was handled by the police. So you were arrested, you were threatened, you, with essentially you could get life. Life in uh, prison. And then you challenge the bail conditions and the, 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 Crown Office, the, the Crown Prosecution Service doesn't want to know. Now that, that's a strange dynamic right there because that suggests that, that there's been an agenda through the police force to get you and that the Crown Office is looking at this and said, there's, there's nothing in this. And they've done their job and good on them. Because I would suggest that if it was the Crown Office in Scotland, you might be in a different position. <clears throat> and they've done the job and said, there's nothing in this. And they've, prote they've protected you from wrongful prosecution, which is, the, which is part of their job. Right? So good on them for doing that. Now, at the same time, I spent 32 hours in custody. You 32 hours in custody. I, it was all done through your lawyer, which is fair enough, but it means that you don't have a very clear idea of what's actually been written down or said. Right? Oh, we will because, have. 
<laughs> we will. <laughs> so I've not yeah. left it there. Yeah, because what happens the next time you go out? Will anything that they've gathered or alleged or will any of this come back upon you in any, well, at, at any point? Or is it completely dead? It's completely dead. It's completely, I can't be charged with any of it. Well, that's what they've said, because I haven't done anything. Uh, and like you've just said at the moment, it shows that the, the CPS aren't corrupt, or that one wasn't yet. <laughs> um, but the point is, I spent 32 hours in custody. Um, they came to my home and came, entered my home, went through my things, and the actual um, search warrant itself, I mean, they stepped over books and literature and papers and peer-reviewed papers and books that were all referenced um, regarding, you know, vaccines, um, virology, and yet they've got on the search warrant um, material for anti-vax, COVID-19 and 5G conspiracy. Right, conspiracy no, is, says who? Yeah, well, well, yeah, this, I've, got a, I've got a problem with this too. This is also very strange. I have a problem with it. A search warrant, a search warrant means, means they've gone before a judge. Is that, that's the way it is in England, I take it, yes? Yeah. So the, the police have gone before a judge and obtained a warrant. That warrant is ref, makes references to anti-vax conspiracy. That's not a crime. No, and it's not a conspiracy either. It's not a conspiracy it? either. But even, even, <laughs> if, even if you buy the official line on this, right? I don't. You certainly don't. That doesn't matter. Even if, if you're a judge and you buy the official line, it's not a crime. It's not a crime to have material in your house that is, that is against the official narrative on COVID. That's not a crime. And Absolutely, and they can enter your house and go through all your property. It, it's very... that I find that the granting of a search warrant under those circumstances very perplexing because that, that implies, again that one of the checks and balances, which is you're not meant to get a search warrant unless there's probable cause, unless there's, there's, there's genuine reason. The courts are meant to protect the individual, protect the sanctity of their home from the state crossing the line. And it seems to have failed in, in, in this case. Right. Absolutely. And, you know, they, um, they came into my house. They took the keys out of my bag. They used my keys to enter. Um, they went, went into my cupboard, into my purse, all my supplements, and there's some thyroid meds in there, and took the thyroid meds out of the cupboard. So they'd gone into my prescription stuff. That wasn't on the search warrant, nor did I give them permission to do so. And then they didn't tell me that they had it. It wasn't until I was leaving, and I was already 24 hours late having it, that I spotted it in the bag. They'd actually gone into my house. I mean, it's a huge violation of, of my rights. Yeah. I, I never gave permission for that. For that. And um, so, so the alarm was on. The alarm was on in my property. I've asked any of my neighbours, did they hear the alarm go off? No. So what did they use to get in your house then? Um, they used my toilet. I mean, I know that's, it's funny to some people, but it's not really. No, I, I, I get how that that's crossing a light. I'll give you a little example. Um, one of the clients I worked for many years ago was a specialist company that did fire and flood um, uh, renovations of houses, fire damaged uh, and flood damaged houses uh, repair. So they worked through the insurance industry and they worked in this specialist area. And whenever they went to, to, to someone's house, they would always take... Um, a cabin or a van that they could have a lunch in and a porta potty that sat outside. And they said to all the people, this is a work site to you, but to the people who have been forced out of their home by this event, this is their home. They're not going to come in and find you sitting around the kitchen table having your lunch and they're not going to find you using the loo. You, you, you eat lunch in the van and you use the loo that's outside. And they were absolutely right because they understood they understood the psychology of your home being damaged and how traumatic that is. And they were going in there to repair the damage and not upset people more. 
So I, I'm absolutely get where you're saying that that was that was an unacceptable act because I mean, it, it is. Someone said to me, "How do you know?" And I said, "Because I've got OCD. I'm I'm so particular. Um, I would know if someone had moved something and there was a drawer slightly open. I mean, they would have seen when they came in my house how particular it is. But you know, the toilet lid was up. That's an absolute crime in my house. And they'd left just a bit of toilet roll on the toilet roll." thing and there was mud on the white tiles and it, I don't ever come in my house with shoes on no one does so um it was it's, it's a violation it is it's well, like I, I understand I'm... people have got to go but it, it's wrong and, yeah. and incidentally I was in a cell and I've had two knee operations on the right and I'd been in high shoes and my knee was really uncomfortable I do a lot of workouts and sometimes if I've done a lot of workouts and sadly my knees really really painful there was nothing to hold on to to use the toilet the toilet in there in the cell and I said to them I just said I don't suppose you've got a disabled toilet have you that's a bit higher and that's got a handle or something and they said to me no it's broken I said it's broken I'm sure that breaks a few guidelines I'm sure you're meant to have a disabled toilet somewhere and they went no it's broken and then when I got home, I said to my friend, oh, they, you know, I can't use their toilet, but they can use mine. Yeah. I'd like to talk a bit about this, this £10,000 quote unquote fine. I'm interested in that as well, right? Uh, I've not seen any paperwork on one of on, on one of these of this magnitude, right? We're all familiar with them for like like parking, 10, parking tickets and things, right? Because it's it's a fixed penalty notice because they, they can't give you a fine. Only a court can give you a fine. And the authorities always say it's a fine. And it's not a fine. What it is is an offer. Or the ones I've seen before, it's an offer. It's an offer for you to accept that you're going to pay. Which I'm not. What Have you seen the paperwork? What does it look like? Is it, is it the same sort of format as a parking ticket or is it something else? Is it, does, it call, does it call it a notice? Acro. Acro, okay. Criminal Records Office. Okay. Yeah, it says uh, penalty notice, health protection, coronavirus restrictions, circumstances regarding the issue. On the 19th of the 9th in Trafalgar Square, Westminster, at 12 o'clock, you were found to be in contravention of the regulations as you contravene requirement not to hold or be involved in holding a gathering of more than 30 people. Being involved in holding, what does that mean? Does that no mean idea. the entire amount of people that were wait, waiting there, 30,000 people? Does that, what about the police? They were gathering. Lots and lots of them. Right, so it is a notice. Now, uh, yeah, so it's the same, it's basically the same as a parking ticket. It's just, they've just taken, they've taken the parking ticket technology, which is working so well gathering so much money <laughs> and, and they've just put a couple of zeros on the end i zero on no ten thousand couple of zeros on the end ten thousand i mean who's yeah. gonna pay that come on yeah and i love the way they put their bank details on the back <laughs> tell you to pay within look is there sort code and transfer do, do, do you no get, one's do, worked do you everyone's get, not been do Sorry. you do you get a uh, uh, money off if you pay within fourteen days? Because that's what they would do with parking tickets. You get. A uh, I think it says um, important. I did read something. I started laughing. Um, maybe it's one of those where they keep doubling it if you don't pay. <laughs> but no, it just says it says uh, you have to pay it, and you pay is your sort code, or you can pay. You can if you wish to contest it, you can write a, a letter. I'm not. I, I'm not going to bother writing. I'll just wait. Um, I, what, the, here's, I've only done parking tickets, right? It's not the same <laughs> scale. But but here's what I've done with parking tickets. Um, is because it's a notice. A notice is something you can't ignore. And I would suggest you don't ignore it, right? Because if you ignore it, you put them in a stronger position. Now, with parking tickets, what I've done is, I've written back and said, look, I, I notice your notice. You see me noticing your notice. This is my notice of noticing your notice. Now, I, I, I see we've got a problem. We've got an issue here. And I'm now the administrator of this account and it will be settled. Uh, but I have a fiduciary duty to make sure everything's in order before any funds are released. 
Therefore, uh, I conditionally accept now parking tickets like 30 quid it starts up, if you pay within the, the, the reduced time. Your, your offer that I pay you 30 pounds. Uh, my conditions are, and then I'll ask them certain questions, like proof of claim that exists a signed two-party contract um, and, uh, and things like that. And I give them 28 days to respond. And I say that if they don't respond within this time, the matter is closed. And if they, they subsequently reopen it, they mobilise my fee scale and give them what my fee scale is. I claim the, the right of set off and fire that off. And, and it, 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 it defeats the system because they can't handle it because it's actually calling out for what it is. It's a notice. It's a notice of an issue. And it's a, by doing the conditional acceptance, um, it, it, it doesn't fall into the create a dispute or pay, which is the two options that they give you. There's actually a third option, which is you conditionally accept. Now, I don't know on something of this scale what you should do, um, but I would I would suggest that ignoring it's not the best thing because if you if well, you ignore I, I, it, you dishonour the notice. So it, yeah, as we I spoke to the barrister, you know, obviously I'm going to I'm I'm, I'm not ignoring it like I'm not, but I mean meaning I'm not paying it. Yeah. There's do you know what's really funny about this? And the bit that made me really smile was, uh, it was people haven't worked. Everyone's businesses are going down the pan. Um, people are losing their homes. People are using food banks. Certainly, I'm sitting in my clinical room. This business has just dropped because people can't afford it. So who can pay that? Where do they think the money's coming from? I mean, if you went to court and said, OK, I can pay it. I can afford a pound a month for the next, you know, 10,000 months. months. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, really? It's so, and, and they're handing these out everywhere. So this, this is now, they're putting as many £10,000 quote-unquote fines that are in fact notices as they can. Yeah, that's, be, that's the policy. Or be involved in holding. Or be involved in holding. What does involved in holding mean? I have no idea. Me neither. So uh, it's quite... And, and the fact is, it's literally like saying monopoly money. Oh, we'll make it 100 quid. Oh, that'll, that'll stop them doing... Oh, well, We'll make it a thousand. That will stop them. No, I'll make it ten now. What's next? Next, next, we want your arm. Cut your arm off and give us your arm. It's just, it's bonkers. It really is bonkers. And uh, and where does it end? Because of course, it, I didn't organise it. So if I was there, then they would have to give everyone a notice, all the other doctors that were there, and the nurses, and even there was a solicitor there, and even chair of the English Democrats and a uh, member of the UK Assembly who's running for mayor next year. These people all spoke at it as well. Are they all going to get a fine? Where does it end? Well, this is it, because what, what, what we're increasingly seeing is that the law is becoming it's an instrument of social control. It's been used as an instrument of social control, and therefore it's, it's, it's unknowable because you don't know what the social control agenda is from one week to the next. So it's impossible to know if you're going to be contravening the law as it's, as it's now defined from one week to the next. Because things which are lawful, and this is the core principle here, peacefully assembling and speaking to one another in a public space is lawful activity. And they're making the lawful unlawful. And they're making the unlawful lawful, and this is this is this is what we're up against. Okay, it's very, uh, it's very, it's very, it, it's crazy. But then again, you know, when I see Nicola Sturgeon, Nicola Sturgeon, and, and she's she's saying, uh, that's not my best Glasgow accent there, <laughs> Nicola Sturgeon. By the way, big we, man. we have but, we uh, have we have a lot of use to spare in Scotland, and we we use them well. You know, we we add them in. <laughs> But I, uh, you know, I, well, I trained as a nurse in Glasgow and lived up there for almost a decade. But, you know, when I see they're making curfew six o'clock, what is this? Six foot apart, assembling six and six o'clock curfew. That's the triple six, the mark of the beast right there. And uh, and then we have to wait to a specific date before we do this curfew. It's just and, and, you know, I, I wrote a tweet today, you know, up north, the further up north you go, you're meant to be hard, right hard. So um, 
I'm expecting for everybody north of Watford Gap to start rebelling really quickly. Yeah, well, it's not quite like that, but um, we'll see how it goes. Um, Nickel is quite close to putting um, prohibition into Scotland. We'll see how that, that runs. Um, <laughs> In the 10 years I lived there. Uh, let, yeah, let's see how that runs, because there's one thing that a, a Scotsman will not let anybody take away his bevy. Well, the it's interesting that the person running the policy in Scotland, uh, Debbie Shridar, um, a colleague of um, Chelsea Clinton, as it happens. Nice. Uh, she wrote a book with Chelsea Clinton about uh, world governance of uh, health. Um, she's also written a paper calling for the World Health Organization to use international law to target alcohol. So there what? is, the, the, yeah, there is, there is an agenda running here, and or many agendas, and we're starting to see little bits of them. Um, showing now so you've 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 got some of your property back um mm. you're, you're no longer under bail conditions and you're no longer under threat of life imprisonment all of which is good um there's a ten thousand pound fine that's actually a notice we'll be very interested to know how that if you keep us informed how that one runs oh i will <laughs> um and, and, and so what, what are you doing next? You, you mentioned lots of information coming in. What, what's the nature of that and, and, and how, how yes. are you planning to, uh, uh, to uh, go forward with it? Well, on my, on my phone uh, and on some of my laptop is a lot of whistleblower testimonies from relatives, from patients, from nurses, um, from uh, many, many of the patients have died and the relatives are saying they've been murdered and nurses and even student nurses. And we got, uh, I'm, I'm working with Dr. Kevin Corbett and we are called, um, we, we, we've got this uh, new kind of film in this new program that we're doing when we're going to different cities and um, the medical revolutionaries. And uh, we are starting to investigate these crimes. And one of them today was really harrowing. It was a student nurse who's been a nursing assistant for years. And basically what she was describing was murder. Right there, right there, murder. And it's been going on for years, but now it's being done. Just, it's being done with, with the mask off now. They're, they're just doing it with the mask off. Like had, they have complete authority. So we are uncovering it. Uh, we're going to be talking about it. We're going to be going uh, to, to different cities. We're going to Brighton to talk about HIV and AIDS, because of course that was the last time we had um, the PCR test used and another lie. Um, another medical tyranny where people died needlessly. And we're going to Eastbourne, which is called God's Waiting Room. It's got a very high population of the elderly because, of course, we've just heard that um, Nick Hancock said that cancer patients won't receive treatment until they've got the coronavirus under control. Well, it's never going to be under control because we've all got coronaviruses and the PCR test isn't a diagnostic tool and just picks up your own DNA. So does that mean that all cancer patients are not going to be uh, receiving any treatment after diagnosis or not diagnosed. And so we're going to be doing that together. Uh, we also are working with a group of us, law, uh, a weapons expert, an expert in paedophilia, who's also a victim, um, a gentleman who is a veteran. Uh, we're all doing another series of programmes really to teach the public what your rights are. And when something is wrong, bringing in, and we're doing this on all platforms of social media, um, that will go on. As for my um, two, two brushes with the law, the Keystone Cops, um, I, I have actually got one case in and I am now filing another for, for um, wrongful arrest. I'm not going to let it drop. Um, I'm just going to keep going because the, the law is the law. It, it is the law at the moment where we are quite fortunate in the UK. I know a lot of people won't think that, um, but it's not like some other countries. So to not pursue it would be foolish of me and I will pursue it. And the other thing is for all those people that have been injured on the 19th and they've all contacted me and sent me some really harrowing, harrowing videos, really close up videos of people being smacked in the face on the head. Um, and these are now all reporting them as crimes, getting crime numbers. Um, they're all going to be then spoken to by um, a lawyer and 
make, make a statement and then hopefully a class action. People have to be held accountable for what they're doing. You know, this TSG, I even, there was even the interview you did with me. Um, there was a police officer, a retired police officer, one of the comments came on your video channel and commented about being hit in the red zone and the training and how his, someone he knew was Metropolitan Police and he just, he just left his job because of it. So uh, we, we are continuing. My, my expertise, if you like, is, is medical uh, and journalism and Kevin's is a researcher and a scientist. So we have to use the tools we've got and we have to push back against this because if we don't push back, we all know what the agenda is and where we'll be or not be. We won't be anywhere. And, uh, you know, the latest thing all about the new vaccine and, and what's in it. And the name of it, Ambush. I mean, who the hell calls it Ambush? Um, so, it, 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 uh, was, it, was a, it was a strange choice. I'll grant you that. That was a, a, a bizarre choice of name. Yes. Uh, and, the, you know, the, the ingredients in it. The fact that, um, incidentally, one, they're, they're talking about killing half a million sharks to get the squalene from the liver. And then that gets mixed with the witch's potion of the other um, chemicals that open your blood brain barrier and destroy your health. And then along with the diploid cells, et cetera, that cause cancer that will be in it. All these things are going to be made into a vaccine and um, all the things that are actually in vaccines, it's, I, make no, I make no secret of the fact that I'm a Christian and, and it will actually tell you, I believe it's in Leviticus, uh, what you can have in your body and you can't have the bat or the eagle or the swine. Or, or a fish with um, fins but no scales. No, and it's, I thought it's, yeah, it's, be... it's without. With, it's only you can only consume. You can only eat fish that have fins yeah. and scales. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can't have it in your body if it hasn't got scales. So all of these things are in vaccines. And so I went on and I did a bit of research and I found this Dr. Macht from the John Hopkins University, who's authored over nine hundred papers, wrote I believe about six books. Kevin went on and researched it further. And he proved um, using science that all the things that were stated in the Bible that we shouldn't have in our bodies because they're poisonous and toxic, that it is indeed true. It's fact. And he proved it all using science. And there's actually an award, a science award in his name and honor that is still given out every year today. And so there it is. Yet more, more stuff you're going to have injected without a license without any comeback on the pharmaceutical company that's making it. So if you drop dead, tough. Uh, Non-medical personnel giving it, who also cannot be held accountable. So if you drop dead, tough. If you develop any illness. And they're calling it ambush. And they're going to, one, one um, uh, politician said they're going to be giving it out, the likes of which haven't been sin seen since Dunkirk, whatever that means. I think they need to do it as quickly as possible because lots of people are going to drop dead and people will get wind of it like they did in Leicester with the smallpox vaccine when all the kids started to die. The parents wouldn't give it, so they put them all in prison. So uh, it's interesting. So again, this is what uh, Kevin and I are in. And, and I was contacted today by Sky, Sky, Sky News. They want to do a um, podcast with me. And they were asking me, you know, about this QAnon and different things. And I think there is a little bit of a shift in people that a lot of people know it's wrong and they're starting to get scared. And they can see it's this whole COVID pantomime, the pandemic is out of control. And they, they have, it is literally the three Ds that the Red Army use, the torture technique, disability, dependency, dread. So they're now dread and they're afraid. So they're now starting to more and more people are starting to look at the dissidents. Us lot, you're a dissident, David. Um, so they're starting to look at us and more and more people are starting to read what they call the alternative media because they're looking for salvation. They want to be saved. They can it, see they'll, 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 turn to, they'll turn to videos on the up and... and um as opposed to, people call it the legacy media. I particularly like, uh, for, for Sky and BBC and people like this, the term the Vichy media. Right? You know, this is, this is it's, it's, they collaborate with oppression. Um, I, 
and people are looking at the alternative media to find to find something authentic, right? So you can go and you can have a pluralism of voices, right? And 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 a, a freedom where you're not just given the one note the whole time. It's not just the same message over and over and over. You've got a whole range of different opinions. And there's an authenticity about a lot of them because people people genuinely believe this. And it, it gives people, I think, comfort because it's it's actually it's normal. It's a normal it's normal for people to disagree and to have different viewpoints and to discuss them and not to be censored and shut down, not to be told you can't possibly say that, that's beyond the pale. You can't think that because to think that is putting lives at, at, at risk. And, and you're thinking, what? No, how? What? No. Um, and I was actually, that was actually said to me, incidentally, in, in, in my incarceration. How did I feel being a nurse and a, um, a Christian woman putting police officers and their families at risk by having this event with all these people there? Again, that's the one way virus. It's yeah, bizarre. And, and, it's, and, it's, and it's one way of responsibility because, of course, it's a peaceful event. And there was no need for the police to charge in at all. Um, they could have just not not done it, and everyone would have gone home and been quite okay. So, yeah, th there's something um, terrorist-like when when the when the state does an action and then blames you for the action. Right? They do something unlawful that harms people, but it's your fault for not for not complying before that unlawful, harmful event was, was, was necessary. So it's not the person who decided, it's the, it's the victim that's somehow responsible. That's the, that's the logic that the IRA used, Sinn Féin used in the, in the 70s to justify yeah. a murder campaign. And you think, well, okay, there's a, the, we're seeing the state use the same thing. That's, that's, that's not good. And um, more and more people are becoming aware that the, 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 the one note, you can only think one thing, you can only believe one thing, viewpoint that's coming forward, doesn't have any real substantiation. And there are many expert voices, there are many dedicated voices, and there are many insightful voices out there saying something else and making more sense. And the fact that they're completely excluded from the public discourse eventually people will, 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 will seek them out because the mainstream line is, is, is not coherent, it's not scientific, it's not rational, it's not reasonable. And it's also, um, because it's a one note over and over, it's repeated over and over and over. I mean, we've had, be afraid of your neighbour because being close to someone, you know, six feet away from them for a few seconds could mean death, right? So you've got to be afraid of people. We've been having that pushed at us a thousand times a day uh, since March. And you can see the impact just ebbing away, right? There are some people who are still very jumpy, but more and more you look around the people you see in the street and they just don't care. They're not buying it. They don't know anyone who's ill. The Guardians reported today of the, 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 the huge number of cases that they're reporting, which is a huge number of positive PCR tests that they're reporting. Which means nothing. Which means nothing. 80% have no symptoms at all. The so they're not sick. So they're, they're not, not sick. sick. And the definition of a case was you have symptoms and the symptoms are severe enough to seek medical attention. That used to be the definition of a case. No, now it's a positive PCR test. So at least 80%, there's nothing there. And as with each step along the way where, that, where information like that becomes publicly known, the, the confidence of the public in the narrative from the government is going to diminish. And, and we're going to see more and more people looking for another answer, looking for rational explanations that help them understand the world. They help them understand the crazy they see around them and know how to behave. This is why you, you talked about talking to people about what the rights are and what right is and how 
essentially in conflict situations, you should resolve the conflict, right? Which is what the law is meant to be doing. This is very important work because if people know how to behave and they know how to conduct themselves and they lose the fear with the loss of fear and with the loss of the feeling of impotence, because I don't know what to do. I feel oppressed. I feel squashed by the system. Um, and people will respond with the rage. And of course, the minute you do that, then you're being aggressive and you're, that becomes a problem. You're arrested for that. So it just plays into the hands of the authorities. Mm. The I was really calm when I was arrested. And this, 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 is, this is excellent. As, as soon as people have the confidence to say, well, I understand what's going on here. I don't need to be angry anymore because I understand what's going on and I understand how I'm going to resist it. And I, I know what I'm, I know on these circumstances what I think because I've thought through the issues beforehand and I know what I'm going to do. That takes the fear away, most of it. It takes the panic away, it takes the rage away and it makes the people who are being acted on by the state much more formidable, much more formidable. And um, getting towards the kind of indomitable, like they just do, you know, don't give up. Like you with your um, a wrongful arrest case, don't give up. Because if that keeps hounding them, the more the, the wrongful actions of the state result in pushback, then the, the more their resources are, are used up by dealing with the pushback. And the more the resources of the people to resist, and those resources of knowledge, uh, abilities, networks, communication, uh, groups of people who support one another, all of this sort of stuff, the more that That's actually, the more that it's grows. Interesting you, it's interesting you say that because one of the things I've noticed, I get so many messages, even though they pulled down on my YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, all in within an hour. I get so many messages on because I gave my number out, but on even on um, Telegram, but on Twitter. And as soon as you say to people, we're here, get in touch with us, like Kevin and I, we announced it today. You want you want to whistleblow your stories, you come to us. Now I was saying that on Facebook all the time. And then people realize they're not on their own. And I said, We'll protect your identity, we'll we'll do it all. Then with people that like have been assaulted, I said, take photographs of it get your videos, report it as a crime, come back to me, I'm gonna put you in touch with a, a barrister, a lawyer, and that's what we've done. And then people don't feel like they're on their own and they, you know, people as well, they haven't got money and they think I, I can't go to the police, I can't, I can't report it, I'll need a lawyer, I don't have the money. No, they don't, you can do it as a big class action. Um, and there's only, there's only so long they can keep doing this. And you're right, people are starting to think, well, wait a minute, this. This isn't right. And the whole thing is, you know, now they've announced in the news, people are getting admitted to hospital. Of course they are. It's the winter damp months. Anyone who's got chest problems, airway problems, the damp, cold days come in and you start to get bronchiolitis. You start to see asthma. These are normal things. Old people with comorbidities start getting um, problems with their chest. This is the normal things. But of course, everybody's going to be, it's all COVID, 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 COVID. You're not allowed to die of anything else. And this is what they're doing. And I think people are starting to see through it. Well, I hope people are starting to see through it. But this is where, you know, myself and Dr. Corbett, and, and he's very articulate. That was an amazing interview you did. We won't stop. Neither of us will give up. And it was really funny. We were in London, just sitting outside a cafe, um, because, you know, you're not allowed, you're supposed to leave your number and everything else and do a load of hoops. We're sitting outside and somebody walked past and just said, are you Kate Shamarani? And you're Dr. Kevin Corbett. Just a passerby. So people do know who we are. Um, yeah, we are it's, it's getting out there. And this is, this is also a very important point because the folk, folk recognise you. Yeah, this is they do. interesting. But that means they're listening, right? And they're listening to messages. I sign <laughs> autographs now. <laughs> But listening to messages, listen to messages from, from, from Dr. Corbett and, and, and so many others. This is a challenge. This is a bigger challenge to the state than, than, than many would imagine. Because what the state needs is it, it needs a, an intellectual bodyguard. It needs intellectual work to justify what it's doing. 
Because if you look at, just look at what it's doing um, on the surface, just look at the, the effects. It's taking old people into hospital and it's and shortening, killing them. killing them, shortening their lives. It's killing them. They're not, sh they're killing them. Okay. I have evidence. They're not just shortening their lives. They are deliberately ending their lives. Deliberately ending They are their not lives. treating them yeah. and they are using medazolam and morphine and ending their lives. Okay. That's murder. That's genocide. And that leaves a paper trail and you will be found. All right. So they're, they're killing old people in the, in, in the, in the, through the, through the quote unquote care system and, 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 and the NHS. Um, they're killing the unborn with the NHS. They're oh, going, horrific. They're, they're, they're shutting down the entire economy for something which is manifestly no worse than, than, than seasonal flu. It, particularly if you're not old and infirm, it's actually much less. If dangerous. it exists at all. If it exists at all, right? And there's even there is there's still there's still questions about that. But for what it, whatever it is, the level of risk is clearly this uh, similar to the level of risk we'd live with all the time. But they're closing down the entire economy. They're they're destroying business after business, life after life, and doing so. And then when people stand up and say, "We don't want this anymore," they're charging in with people with shields and batons, and they're smacking them in the head. Now, if you look at all of that, right, that's that's manifestly wrong. It's manifestly unlawful. It's manifestly evil. Now, the state does this on all of our coin. Okay, the state does this with our tax money and the special privileges they've granted themselves, which ultimately we'll be paying for in various ways. That's what actually generates this. So there needs to be some level of acceptance by the public that the state has the right to do that. Now, we've seen the level of acceptance that actually exists in this country, because when COVID came in, the level of obedience that the most of the public, right, apart from dissidents like you and me and the people at the UK column and, 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 and Dr. Corbett and, and you know, and a, and a group of others, Peter Hitchens and, you know, you know there's, a, there's, a, there's a group of people who were just not going to buy it. But the vast majority of the people, the masses of the people, were obedient to this to an, to an extraordinary degree, right? They mm. changed their lives and they did it with hardly a, hardly a murmur of protest. Okay, you're the boss, I'll do it. So the degree of the degree of obedience to the government was very very high, um, but this needs to be maintained because the people have to be convinced that it's still reasonable, and this needs a bodyguard of intellectual work to justify it. So when someone says, "I think that the lockdown is completely unreasonable," right, and the government come back, they'll have an expert, they'll have a guy in a white coat or with a with a with a PhD who will come back and say. No, you're literally killing people by saying that. That's so dangerous to say that. So that's an, that's an intellectual bodyguard that then justifies the man with a truncheon hitting the protester in the face. The, the man with a truncheon can only do that because the public have been convinced by the intellectual work that the person whose face is smashed in Kind of, kind of deserved it. Kind of brought it on himself because he really, you know, he shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't be there. It's the, I it's think, the, I think that's it's what the ideas come first. So work to challenge the ideas is essential. It's vital, and that that will give people the intellectual ground in which to stand to resist. I think, yeah, absolutely. We were called. We are called a group of us where we've got, you know, a veteran, a lawyer, we're called Resist and Act. Uh, I saw a tweet from Pretty Patel, and uh, I'm sorry, but it's such a shame she's got the first name Pretty, you know, phonetics of it, because what she actually wrote was horrific. In, in her tweet, it was about how she would be, they would be very firm with people who aren't, who are putting the others at risk. And it's, it, uh, you must find that tweet or I'll send it to you. And it's horrific. Firm, what does she mean by firm? And putting others at risk. Who's putting who at risk? It was actually, it was a little threat. It was, it was, it was just a threat in there. And all of what we see right now, and I know I've upset the, um, 
the uh, what is what are they called? The Jewish, I can't remember what you call it. Some Jewish Jewish Chronicle. I know I've upset them oh, because we've, we've said, all, we've when... all, no, 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 no. We've all upset the Jewish Chronicle. I've upset the oh, Jewish. Good. I did. I did. I've upset them twice. I had the editor of the Jewish Chronicle called me an anti-Semite, and do you know why? Because oh, I was called that. because I was sticking up for a Jewish guy, but it was it was just the wrong Jewish guy. It was one you didn't like. Uh, the Jewish Chronicle is um, a not, snowflake not, magazine. Not credible. No. Well, what they did was say because I said, "When are the British people? Well, English people. I'm going to say English people here." You're the Scottish people. When are they going to wake up when they're in the cattle trucks or in the showers? And of course, that was, oh, it was offensive to Jewish people. And so I did remind them that no, it wasn't just the Jews that died in the Holocaust, because that was gypsies, blacks, the elderly and infirm and those who had disabilities. Mentally Polish. handicapped. Mentally handicapped. Exactly. The now, now let's just let's just look through history here. We have them telling us that we need to have papers. Dina Papira bitter. We have to have papers, health papers. We're being told wear a lanyard. One schoolboy was given a, a, a gold star to wear on his lapel of his collar because he couldn't wear a mask. Um, we, we're told we have essential workers, key workers. Yep. Where have we heard all this before? Now we have the elderly, the infirm, those who cannot reach their desired life goals, who are critical frailty scores six and above. On the 29th of April, 2020, the National Institute for the Centers of Excellence, controlled by the government, gave authority to the nurses and doctors that they could remove all medical care, that's food, water, and essential medications from those patients. So they can kill them. They've been given a license to kill. Where else did we see that? The nurses of the Third Reich. And we're seeing all of the same things again. The same words are being used. I'm sorry if, if it's offensive. And also Dr. Kevin Corbett authored the paper, The Nazification of the NHS. This is exactly what's happening. It's exactly what's happening. It's all the same all the way through. Now we have... Cressida Dick, uh, Criminal Justice Act 2015, Part 1, 26.2, Abuse of Police Powers and Privileges, tells the public to shame those who aren't wearing masks. So she's inciting bullying and violence. And that's exactly what you're seeing. The people policing the people, just like Nazi Germany. There wasn't enough guards. You had the brown shirts. A man kicked a woman in the face on a bus for not wearing a mask. And this is what we see. We have people in restaurants and bars acting in a very authoritarian way to customers that are coming in. Write your name down. Do this. No, you can't be said. Where's your mask? Why aren't you wearing a mask? So we're seeing people policing the people. This is all being done. People are being given the authority. So... The rest of us as dissidents, I mean, what happened to the dissidents in the last one? In the middle of the night, everything went out and your neighbours disappeared and they went again. Um, but, but folks, you know, this isn't going away. This is since March. This has got worse. Civil liberties are going down the pan and you need to shake yourself and rise because uh, it is happening and the economy can't recover. Uh, I've been speaking to a lot of people in uh, in banking really high up and they say we can't recover from this. A guy from JP Morgan said we cannot recover. Not So, you know, when are people going to go? And, and then what was it? Asda has announced they've just employing a thousand distribution marshals. Do you know what that is? It's It's exactly what you have. It's rationing. Yeah. distribution marshals that's to, that's to prevent all the toilet paper going at once again yeah <laughs> yes yep. so, so so this is all here and they're just it's just a different time yep. it's a different time in history are we going to be the new monument lest we forget all that died in 2020 and 2021 and you don't have to go very back far back through history look at former yugoslavia i remember yugoslavia how many people were slaughtered there? Srebrenica. This is in our lifetime. I was in my late 20s. 
This is happening again. And they've already started slaughtering the elderly, the infirm, the disabled, the sick people. They're already being murdered. I have proof of this. Well, Kate, uh, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, but maybe next time um, when we have a chat, we can look at the, the, the situation specifically of the elderly and the, and the proof that you have. Yeah, absolutely. My uh, Myself and Kevin Corbett, there's nothing we'd like better. And uh, if, just anyone out, I know there's a lot of nurses and doctors in, who've watched this. If you are a nurse and doctor and you're seeing this and you're doing nothing, you're complicit in a crime, you have to report it to your superior and then you just follow the chain of command. You have to document it, dates, times who is involved you don't need to write the patient's name down but if you are there and doing nothing you are responsible as a registered nurse for your acts and your omissions your omissions you're complicit in a crime and i can absolutely assure you of this until there's no breath in my body i'm coming for you every one of you kate thank you very much um thank you for having me uh the the need to speak out, the need to resist, the need to stand up for the simple things which are true, such as life, such as health, uh, such as friendship, and such as uh, being able to be peaceful with our neighbours and not live in fear is, has never been more pressing. Um, and uh, for this reason, these reasons, I'm sure we'll have much to talk about in weeks and months to come. But for tonight, thank you very much. Thank you.